Welcome to another session of hashtag LD Edu Chat, Leadership Development and Education Online. And today we have the brilliant, thought-provoking Steve Mumby, who will be looking at imperfect leadership. On Twitter, we have Flora Burt, who will be uh, taking over our at Chilton TSA, at Chilton TSA Twitter handle. And so do get engaged on there as well. Use the hashtag LD Edu Chat, just so we can find your comments really easily. Do subscribe. Those of you that haven't used the notifications on YouTube, there is a little bell sign in the top right hand corner. And that just notifies you any time that we post any content on there. And we have got still a lot of sessions to come until the until the end of July. And we've got more coming after that with announcements for that will happen over the next couple of weeks in terms of what we're doing after July, after our academic year ends. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to start Steve's presentation. See you soon. Well, it's my great pleasure and privilege to talk to you today about imperfect leadership in times of crisis and uncertainty. I'm not a researcher or an academic, but I have led three large education organizations over 17 years, and I have experienced a fair number of challenges and crises in that time. I've had to deal with gangs carrying guns, the murder of children, death of members of staff, strikes and picket lines, wholesale redundancies. But there's nothing as challenging as school leaders and uh, national leaders have had to deal with in the past few months during this pandemic. I saw someone on Twitter say, but it's like, my leadership development program never prepared me for this. And of course, she's right. It didn't prepare them for this. There was no syllabus which said on a leadership development program, which said how to lead in a pandemic. You can't go to an experienced leader and say, how did you manage it last time? Because there was no last time. We're in uncharted territories. And it's quite extreme in some cases. I know of someone who was appointed a principal of a secondary school. It was her first principalship. And it was a different school from where she'd been the deputy. And she was appointed over Easter. And during the Easter period, a science teacher died of COVID-19. Now, it's tough enough to deal with the death of a member of staff when you're an experienced principal. To do it in a school you've not been to before and in your first ever principalship is very tough. And then to add to the fact you can't bring the staff together physically or the students together physically to grieve together makes it particularly challenging and indeed unprecedented. So it's, it's been a very, very difficult time, a very challenging time for people. But I do think there are still some principles that we can use when leading in a crisis. So I want to talk about six principles for leadership in a crisis and a time of uncertainty. And in doing so, I'm going to refer to the book I wrote last year, Imperfect Leadership, a book for leaders who know they don't know at all. Now, why did I call the book Imperfect Leadership? Well, I called it that because I think that's the best term to describe my own leadership. But it's not something I'm embarrassed about or ashamed of. I'm proud to be an imperfect leader because I think I have a problem with this idea of perfect leadership. If we think we have to be perfect as a leader, we will do our heads in. We'll make ourselves mentally and physically ill. And instead of devolving responsibility, we'll try and do it all ourselves. And we won't help others to step up into leadership because they think I have to be perfect too. So I think we should be speaking in praise of imperfect leadership. And I think there are some particular aspects of leadership in a crisis and time of uncertainty that are important for imperfect leadership. So the first principle I want to talk about today is being a servant leader. And by being a servant leader, this is what I mean. It means servant leaders don't ask themselves, what kind of leader do I want to be? They ask themselves, what kind of leadership is wanted of me? Because actually, as leaders, we have to ask, if we're servant leaders, we have to ask ourselves, what do the children, young people, parents and families need from me as a leader now? Now, we all develop our leadership approach over time. Leaders need to develop their own leadership style based on their beliefs and values, their expertise and skills, their personality and their context. Much of this is fixed, but some of it changes. So we need to change with it. And actually, it's quite hard to change as a leader, especially if you're an experienced leader. Like teachers, leaders can form habits and develop ways of behaving that have served them well in the past and that become instinctive. I know this is true of me. This can make it harder 
for leaders to change in the future. Now, we don't have to change fundamentally. We've still got our, our beliefs, our values, our personality, uh, our expertise. But if our context changes, we need to adapt our leadership to that new context. Now, I don't know whether you've seen this slide of the sigmoid curve. Many of you will have done. It says that organizations tend to improve, reach maturity, and then decline. And if you, as the leader, spot that you're nearly at the top of that curve and change things, you can get another improvement. If you wait too long till you're coming down the other side, it's much more difficult to make the change that's needed. And in my own leadership, I know there's at least twice in my leadership when I failed to spot a change in context quickly enough and failed to adapt my leadership quickly enough to meet that new context. But with COVID-19 and the pandemic, the context is pretty clear. Things have changed. We know that. So what we have to ask ourselves clearly is this. The kind of leadership that was needed from us six months ago may not be the leadership that's needed from us now in terms of ways of working, communication, prioritization, uh, devolving responsibility. So the question is, what might I need to change in my ways of working in order to make sure that my leadership meets the needs of my new context as a servant leader, not the leader I want to be, but the leadership that is needed of me. That's the first principle. The second principle of leadership in times of crisis and uncertainty is show up and walk into the wind. Now this may seem a pretty obvious point, but it's amazing the number of leaders who don't show up in a crisis. I could have chosen lots of examples, but I'm gonna give you three. The first one is Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Southeast coast of, of USA was devastated. Thousand people killed, $125 billion of damage. President Bush flew from his home in Texas, flew over the site of the devastation, could see it from below, see it below, and carried on flying to Washington to the White House, where he thought he was best needed. His failure to turn up during Hurricane Katrina was a real damage to his credibility, and, and some would say he never really recovered. The second example I want to use is uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison in Australia and the bushfire crisis of 2019-20. 34 people were killed, $4.4 billion of damage. Now, the Prime Minister had just fought a tough election. He was tired. His family were tired. He was briefed about the big danger of these bushfires, and they were coming. But he made the decision to go to Hawaii on holiday anyway. His credibility was seriously damaged by that decision. He thought he could run, he could lead from his holiday home, but the message it sent to his people were he didn't care. And the third example is Aberfan in Wales in 1966, when there was a, a, a slag heap fell, fell upon a school and killed 109 children and five teachers. A huge crisis, a major disaster. And the queen chose not to turn up. She chose not to go there. She felt she was, she'd get in the way. She, was, um, she wasn't the best person to be there. She'd be a distraction. She didn't turn up until eight days later. And many decades later, she said in 2002, that not going to visit Aberfan straight away was at the biggest regret of her reign. So um, in terms of what I'm saying here, in terms of leadership, is we show up. On these occasions in crisis, we don't delegate. Unless we are actually too ill to be there, or it's physically impossible for us to be there. We don't rush to our offices to respond to urgent requests from the DFE. We don't spend the day hiding away doing strategic planning, confident that our team has it all under control, even if we think that they will have it all under control. In these situations, the community and those you lead need their leader, the boss, the person ultimately in charge to be there, to empathize, to connect, to show to them how important this is and how important you think it is. Now, I've not had the experience of these national disasters, but here's an example from my own leadership. When I was Director of Education in Nosley, in Merseyside, I had responsibility for 80 schools in those days. And I got a phone call from the uh, principal of a high school, secondary school. He said, I'm ringing you because I'm frightened for my life. So I said, what's, what's happened? He said, well, we just uh, temporarily excluded a student and I brought his parents in to tell him about this. And the father came in. So I was explaining to the father why we were temporarily excluding his child. And he said, you can't do this. So I, I explained to him what the rules were and why it was happening. He said, no, you misunderstand me. 
I won't let you do this because I'll do you harm. Ask the police about me. So then the father left with the child. And so the principal ran the police. And the police said, ah, he's a gangster and a killer. We can't protect you. So then he ran me. Uh, and was, I could have done a number of things when I got that phone call from the head teacher. I could have uh, called the superintendent of the police. I could have sent uh, a school advisor to the school. I didn't do that. I said to him, I'll be there in 20 minutes. I got in my car, I go straight to his school, went straight to his office and said, from now on, you are not dealing with this on your own. We're going to deal with this together. And we sorted it. We got police protection. We moved the exclusion hearing uh, away from the school and it was all fine. But many years later, uh, I bumped into the head teacher at a concert in Manchester. And he saw me, came up to me and said, I will never, ever forget that when I was so frightened, you showed up. So we show up as leaders in those times of crisis. But we don't just show up. We walk into the wind. We choose to walk into the wind. And that's a decision we take. Because we know it's easier to walk with the wind behind us. But sometimes we know in our hearts that although it's tough, the right thing to do is to walk into the wind and to take on those challenges and to make those difficult decisions. Our stomach may be churning. We may rather be under the duvet that day rather than go in. But we go in and we do the hard things because we know those hard things will make the difference. So in terms of what we should do, we know it's tough. I saw this uh, blog on Twitter, which was very powerful. I found her sobbing over the laptop. There's just so much of it. It keeps going and going. I'll never manage it all. I don't want to do it anymore. Whilst this could easily have been me with my mascara running down my face, struggling to breathe through my distress at any point this week in the face of 41 updates from the DFE, a mountain of logistics to climb and an unimaginable amount of risk to calculate. It was in fact my daughter worried about her A-levels, overwhelmed with the scale of all that lay before her. But the sense of impending failure, panic, shame and anger at how unprepared she felt was horribly familiar. Now I do think many, many school leaders have been feeling like that over the past few weeks. Many have felt isolated, stressed, worried, but they've shown up and they've walked into the wind. They haven't avoided those difficult things, those irate parents, those stressed teachers, those worried children. They've walked into the wind. Because good leaders know that we might have to fall down seven times when we get up eight. But because we're imperfect, and we know we're imperfect, sometimes we need help to get up again. And that's why asking for help is such an important principle of imperfect leadership, such a good one. Which brings me to my next principle. Before I do that, let me ask you this question. Are there issues in your leadership that you've been avoiding? Is it time that you walk into the wind? So the next principle is ask for help internally and externally and be an invitational leader. And I think invitational leadership and asking for help is a really powerful leadership strategy and is underused. And there are three reasons why it's such a good strategy. The first reason is it leads to better and cleverer strategies. I'm going to show you a photograph now. It's a photograph of the office I used to work in when I was director of education in Knowsley. And the view I had from my office, which was McDonald's in a car park. And I went straight from that job as director of education in a small metropolitan borough council to being chief executive of the National College for School Leadership in England. And that was my office. And you can see it was a huge building. Some of you will have been there. It had a, a moat and a lake. It had swans and the occasional heron. It had a hundred bedrooms, a restaurant and a bar. That's a photograph of the bar. And when I got the job, I was told that one of my roles was to advise the Secretary of State about school leadership. Well, I'd never even met a Secretary of State before, never mind advise them on school leadership. I was completely out of my depth. So what, you do, what do you do when you're out of your depth? Well, the sensible thing to do is to ask for help. And that's what I did. I got myself four mentors. First one was Estelle Morris, former Secretary of State, who helped me to understand the politics, the machinery of government, how officials worked, how politicians worked. 
that was invaluable to me. The second uh, mentor I got was Tim Brighouse, who, as you know, was a huge leader of great, very impressive man with great moral purpose. He was really helpful to me in his strategic thinking. The third mentor I got uh, was one of the best networkers I knew. And I knew that I was going to be successful as CEO of a national college. I needed to network well so that people who could do us harm or good were more likely to be on our side. So I needed someone to introduce me to all these people and he performed that role. And the final mentor I got was a guy called David Albury who had written just before this a critical report on behalf of government about the National College for School Leadership. And I figured that if he knew what was wrong with the place, he could help me to sort it. I could not have done that job without that help. What it says to me is, why should any leader think they can do a leadership role without asking for mentors? And they should choose their mentors based on the expertise that they've got and they haven't got. And why only one? I had three or four throughout my time as a leader over those 17 years. And interestingly, the longer I'm in the job, the more I need the expertise and the help. Because I get too close to the organisation. I need someone from outside the organisation to challenge me and help me to think it through. Asking for help leads to better decisions. Now, I don't know whether you saw the press conference with Jurgen Klopp just before the lockdown, when he was asked by uh, the press why the, he was holding a football match just before the lockdown. His reply was, I'm a football manager, not an epidemiologist. Sorry, uh, ask me about football and management, ask the epidemiologists about coronavirus. Because Klopp understood what he was expert in and what he wasn't expert in. And he knew it was right to ask for advice from the experts. Now compare that with Donald Trump, who in a recent uh, press conference said this, and then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in one minute. And is there a way that we can do something like that? By injection inside or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets in the lungs. So I'd be interesting interested to check that. Now here you have a leader who doesn't believe in asking experts, he thinks he's an expert in everything. And you see the difference. Asking for help, asking for support from ex for experts is the right thing to do in a crisis. The second reason why being an invitational leader and asking for help is a good thing to do is because it builds a sense of collective ownership and is more likely to, stay, to change behaviors. If we say as a leader, this is the broad direction I want us to go in, but I need some help to do it. Work with me to solve the problems, think creatively, remove the barriers. That builds a sense of collective responsibility. Everyone feels that they're all in it together and they're all collectively responsible. Now compare what's happened recently in terms of the plans to reopen schools in Wales with the plans to reopen schools in England. In Wales, the Minister uh, for Education, Kirsty Williams, got all the key stakeholders together, the, the local authorities, the head teachers, the unions, the officials, and they worked together to create a joint plan as to what they were gonna do, thinking creatively about what was achievable and what might be done. In England, they had a bit of consultation and then they announced, but on June the 1st, or reception, year one and year six children will be going back to school. Even the unions that are being consulted on this were surprised by the announcement, never mind teachers and head teachers. Yet it proved to be really, really hard to implement. Now, of course, school leaders stepped up and did what they could, but this is a top-down approach which doesn't build collective responsibility, nor does it help to solve the clear problems that were in the way of doing it that way. So being an invitational leader asking for help internally within your organization helps to build collective ownership and is more likely to change behaviors. And the third uh, reason for doing this is asking for help from your team helps to build trust amongst the team and encourages others to ask for help too. I don't know whether you've seen Patrick Lencioni's work on the five dysfunctions of a team, but he says fundamental to a good team is a sense of trust between each other trust in the leader and trust between colleagues. And he says, when you see trust in teams, you see these kinds of behaviors. People are admitting weaknesses and mistakes, asking for help, accepting questions and input about their areas of responsibility, uh, taking risks and offering feedback and assistance, appreciating and tapping into one of their skills and experience, 
of freedom of accept apologies. Now, these are characteristics of the imperfect leader. Someone who admits mistakes, asks for help, genuinely wants to know what the expertise of the team and tap into the expertise of the team. If we do that and if we model that, other people in our team are far more likely to do those behaviours as well. So if you want to build trust amongst our team, asking for help is a key way of doing it. And then when we devolve responsibility to our colleagues, if we're confident they'll ask for help when they need it, it makes us more confident in devolving responsibility in the first place. So my question is this, am I asking for help that I need internally and externally? And is there more that I could do to model invitational leadership in order to build trust amongst my team? Okay, principle four is be decisive, but be quick to review, and if necessary, amend. When you're in a crisis, you need to make decisions. People don't want a ditherer. They want you to make decisions. There's a need for clear direction. Sometimes actually what's important is just to make a decision. So on the one hand, we need to be decisive. On the other hand, we need to be open to the fact that given the fact that it's very uncertain, we could make the wrong decision. So after careful reflection, we take advice from experts, we make a decision. It's important that we do get the advice of experts. Even with good advice around us, we can still get that wrong. Now, if you think about how Kennedy handled the Cuban Missile Crisis, he got a range of advice. He listened to a whole range of people. And what he saw were two camps emerging. The kind of, let's attack the Soviets camp, and the peacemakers who said, let's try diplomacy a bit more. And often you'll find in a, in a time of crisis when you're leading a school, first of all, that people's behavior will become more extreme because they're stressed and they're angry and they're uncertain themselves. You need to be aware of that as a leader. But secondly, we might find camps forming. The group in the school that thinks we should do it this way, the group in the school that thinks we should do it this way. And it's important, as, as, as President Kennedy did in the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's important for us not to identify with a camp, but to stand above it and help to see the big picture. And fortunately for President Kennedy and for the world, he was able to stand above it and he was able to make the right decision. So my question here is, make a decision, but be quick to review and if necessary, amend. I don't know whether you saw the quote from David Bell. If you made a bad call at the beginning of the crisis or have misstepped along the way, change course fast and don't make sorry the hardest word. So we take a decision, but we keep reviewing it closely. And if it's not working, we're prepared to change it and to accept the responsibility for our mistake and say sorry. And one of the things that you've noticed about politicians is that many of them find it really hard to say sorry. They can say, I am sorry that, but they don't say, I'm sorry, we got that wrong, it was a mistake, and I take responsibility. Apologies, colleagues, do not work unless we say that we accept responsibility. When it comes to an apology, the most important component is an acknowledgement of responsibility. Say it's your fault that you made a mistake. So my fourth question is this, am I avoiding any decisions that need to be taken? And how good am I at accepting responsibility when things go wrong and changing tack accordingly? Now the fifth principle of leadership in times of crisis and uncertainty is deal with the urgent, but build in some space for the strategic and for the future. The urgent is essential. You know, people are looking to you for leadership. They need you to lead, need to address what's coming at them. But sometimes the urgent can become compelling and almost appealing. It can become attractive because sometimes the, the adrenaline's flowing, you feel important, you think you're making a difference. You can get so wrapped up in that that you can fail to act strategically. Even in a crisis, colleagues, it's important to set some resource aside to look at the future, to look at the big picture. Michael Barber in a recent blog tells a story of how in 1940, when London was at war and completely isolated, and it was being blitzed every day by German bombers, and most of Western Europe had already been conquered by the Germans. 
Even at that time in 1940, a small number of senior officials from the then Board of Education settled into a few rooms at a hotel in Bournemouth and set about the task of designing a school system for after the war. Four years later, this provided a foundation for the 1994 Education Act, sorry, 1944 Education Act and the post-war education system. So building in time, even in a crisis, to see the big picture. Now, we've heard a lot of talk about how we shouldn't um, waste the opportunity of a crisis. And the pandemic is horrible, but it does throw up opportunities. And the opportunity is this. Are we going to go back to the old normal or are we going to build a new normal? So I want you to imagine that we're in 15 months time. The pandemic has gone. We've had a successful vaccine. We no longer have it as an issue in our education system. And it's now late 2021 and we've come through the other side. So hello from the other side with apologies to Adele. After the pandemic, I want to suggest that three things might have happened nationally as a result of the pandemic that were good things for the system. The first one is a renewed valuing of schools, a move away from a technocratic approach to a more rounded perspective on education. Now, there's been some great online learning going on in home throughout the land during the pandemic. And uh, after the pandemic, we'd learned from that. We've, uh, we've applied some of that best technology, that best pedagogy using technology into how we're running our schools. And that's a good thing. But everyone agreed after the pandemic that we really had missed schools. It taught us the real value of schools. We miss schools not just for the chance for students to learn again through a well-taught face-to-face curriculum, but also for the other hugely positive aspects of school life. So after the pandemic, there was a much clearer view amongst the general public and from government that schools are so much more than organisations that exist to enable young people to pass examinations and tests, important though those are. The value of schools as communities of people came through strongly during the pandemic and was not forgotten. For many young people, schools provide a feeling of safety and security that perhaps they don't get at home. A sense of order and expectations that may be lacking elsewhere. For some students, it may be the only place where they have a positive and valued relationship with a significant adult or a chance to spend time with a friend who likes them and who values them. And schools help us to explore possibilities not just in classrooms with teachers, but in all kinds of social interaction that take place during the school day. They connect us with people who are like us and people who are not like us, encouraging us to embrace diversity and to explore identity. And we miss schools for the humour, for the interaction, for the sense of belonging. And of course, this applies to staff as well as for children and young people. So after the pandemic, there was a deeper public recognition of this. The government too became less concerned about measuring performance against PISA tests and examination results and more concerned than there had been about the broader aims of education and the crucial role that schools play in our society. As a result of the pandemic, well-being and community engagement came back on the agenda as part of the core purpose of what schools are about. The second change from the other side after the pandemic is that there were fewer isolated schools. Regions and sub-regions became more important. There was a stronger focus on working together across local areas in the interests of all children and the whole community. The lessons we learned from the pandemic is that isolated schools struggled. And where it went well was either local authorities or multi-academy trusts or federations collaborating together with each other to do something that was right for the whole community. That's where it worked really well. So after the pandemic, the government realised and devolved more responsibility for oversight and support in education to regions, to sub-regions, to regional mayors and sub-regions, with MAT CEOs and other key stakeholders from the local authority having a key place together in the decision-making process. And as a profession, structures became less important, whether you were a MAT, an academy, or a local authority schools. What was much more important was to focus on collaboration to put the needs of children and the community in the locality first rather than the needs of a particular institution. 
And the third and final change that happened as a result of the pandemic, we stepped back from a high stakes and top down accountability system. There's great emphasis on collective responsibility. School performance tables and school inspections stopped for the best part of 12 months during the pandemic. And interestingly, the profession didn't take a big sigh of relief and just rest and, and get complacent. They didn't do that. They said, this is an opportunity to shape a new kind of accountability that's about collective responsibility. Not in a complacent or cozy way, but in a robust way. So by September 2021, there's a real realization across all levels, including government, that the top-down nature of the high-stakes accountability system, fed by Ofsted and by the use of school performance tables, and used to make significant judgments about the future of schools and the future of school leaders, have been doing more harm than good. Accountability continued to uh, ensure that public money was spent appropriately, to ensure that children were safe in school and ensure that parents could have confidence in schools to educate and care for their children. Ofsted was slimmed down further. Ofsted grades disappeared except for inadequate. Increasingly, schools were expected to set out to parents and the local community what they hoped to achieve. Not just on academic progress, but on other aspects too, such as well-being and engagement, and were prepared to be held collectively responsible by the community for what they were setting out to achieve, by their colleagues, by the community, and by each other. So my question to you is, these things might happen. My question to you is, what are your hopes and ambitions for your school, so that your school doesn't just snap back into the new normal, into the old normal? What, what could be the new, better normal? What could that look like for your school and for your community? And the last principle I want to talk about for leadership in a time of uncertainty is lead with empathy and authenticity and do the right thing. In 2010, Goffey and Jones wrote a book called Why Should Anyone Be Led By You? And they said there are two reasons why people are likely to want to be led by you. And the first is if, you, if the leader, if you show authenticity, honesty, if you accept that you, when you get things wrong and make mistakes, if you're genuine, if you're not playing games. And the second reason they said that people will want to follow you is if they think you might know what you're doing some of the time, if you've got some credibility. Now, I think one of the leaders that's come out very well during this pandemic has been Angela Merkel. Because she's a scientist and has that knowledge of, of scientific aspects and health aspects, she's been able to talk very credibly, but she's also done it authentically. She's talked in a way which is transparent and she treated people as grown-ups. She's extremely well informed, but I think it mainly comes from her character, her thoughtfulness and ability to reassure. Openness, authenticity, and credibility. But I think the person probably who's come out best of all in the past few months as a national leader has been Jacinda Ardern. Remember how she said to the children at Easter that we consider both the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy to be essential workers. She spoke to them genuinely and empathized with them. And she also announced during the pandemic that because the citizens were having such a hard time economically, she and her team and public service CEOs would take a 20% pay cut. What, the, what people felt about Jacinda Ardern as she was leading them, was well, she wasn't talking at them, she was standing with them. And this sense of fairness, of not expecting other people to do things that you're not prepared to do, is at the heart of what good leadership looks like in a crisis. It's not what um, President Trump's done, if you look at the, compare that to what Donald Trump says, by far the most recurring utterances from Mr. Trump in the briefings are self-congratulations, often predicated on exaggerations and falsehoods. He does credit others, but he also blames others more than 120 times for inadequacies. So with Trump, we have self-congratulation, defensiveness, and blaming others. That does not build trust, and it's not how to lead in a crisis. Vivian Robinson, who is a great writer on school leadership, says we need four things as leaders. We need to use our knowledge, our expertise, solve complex problems in our schools, build relational, relational trust, emphasize the relationship side, 
and demonstrate virtues, not just hold values, live the values, demonstrate the values, model the values. And here I'm going to be a bit critical of the government. One of my, someone I'm a great fan of is Laura McKinney. And this is what she says about um, Prime Minister Johnson and uh, Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings. She says they think of it as a game. She says, the thing about Cummings, Gove and Johnson is they see all this as part of the game. Do what you want until you're stopped. Then do the minimal amount of penance if proven to be wrong and then carry on. Outrage makes no odds. Now that's not living the values. That's just playing a game. Now contrast that with Sir Ernest Shackleton, who uh, led an expedition and everyone got back safely from his ex expedition to the South Pole. And this is what he said. Life to me means the greatest of all games. The danger lies in treating it as a trivial game, a game to be taken lightly, a game in which rules don't matter much. The rules matter a great deal. The game has to be played fairly or it is no game at all. Even to win the game is not the chief end. The chief end is to win honorably and splendidly. To this end, several things are necessary. Loyalty is one, discipline is another, unselfishness is another, courage is another, optimism is another, and chivalry is another. My question then is, in times of crisis, is there more that we can do to walk in the shoes of those we lead and see things from their perspective, as Angela Merkel does? As, as, as Jacinda Ardern did. Do I need to review my approach to fairness? How I'm modeling that so we're all in this together? And am I flexing my ethical muscle? Am I exhibiting virtues, not just values? Now in conclusion, I just want to say a few things. One of my great heroes, and I've already mentioned him in this speech, is Sir Tim Brickhouse. He said, if we're leading in times of uncertainty, we should have four things. We should regard crises as the norm and complexity as fun, have a bottomless well of intellectual curiosity, complete absence of paranoia and self-pity, and unwarranted optimism. I just want to pick up on that last one. Uh, I did a, lot, did a lot of work in Africa in my last job. And I remember driving back from a slum in Nairobi and I drove past this school and the name of the school astounded me. And I promise you this is true. The name of the school was soon Big Brain Academy, a school of excellence. Now that is optimistic leadership. Come to our school and you'll soon have a big brain. And that's part of what we need to do in these times, help people to see a brighter future for them. Now imperfect leaders know they don't know it all. Some leaders think that they do. And again, sorry to quote Donald Trump again. He says, nobody's ever been more successful than me. But imperfect leaders know that's not what it's about. Imperfect leaders, are servant leaders. They know it's not all about them. They show up and they walk into the wind, even if they may need some help to do so. They ask for help internally and externally, building trust and collective responsibility. They are decisive, but they review what they're doing. And when they get it wrong, they admit it. Sorry isn't the hardest word. They deal with the urgent, but they give space for the strategic. And they deal with empathy and authenticity and do the right thing. They know that everyone is fighting a hard battle and that no one is perfect. Colleagues, there's no program for leading in a pandemic. What we can do as imperfect leaders is show up with determination and resilience to reach out and ask for help. And most of all, to do what is right and stay true. As one school leader tweeted in the midst of the crisis, this is what he said, we are solid. We will look after our colleagues, our kids, and our communities. We feel privileged to be able to serve. Thank you. Prided ourselves on these sessions to be honest and as realistic as possible. And I don't think you could be as honest and as authentic as that presentation was. Um, and just looking at the feed that I'm getting on Twitter, um, and the comments that we've seen on here. Um, I think there are many, many people that have really wished that they'd seen and heard Steve Mumby years ago, earlier on in their careers. 
because um, it would have given them the strength to do actually what they wanted to do and remain true to themselves. So um, without further ado, I want to welcome Steve Mumby to the E stage. Thank you. Great to be here. And uh, I just want to thank you for uh, such a um, thought provoking and, and as I said, I can't use the word enough, honest <sighs> reflection on where we have been where we are now and also I love the bit in terms of the hello from the 2021-22 because I think we need that we need to think what are we what should we be saying to ourselves uh, from the future in terms of what we want to carry forward and what we want to be as leaders as institutions and what you know the values that we hold dear to us now what do we want to carry forward with us and, and find the strength to do that. So thank you so much. I know you were concerned that what happens if we don't get any questions? I think there's some really deep uh, uh, questions that are coming through. And I know just from previous sessions, there will be more questions coming through as we talk. Um, so where did you want to jump to first, Steve? Uh, I wanted to go to um, Robin's question at the beginning, which yep. was um, to do with differing leadership in a crisis and dealing when things are going well. Uh, is that, uh, That's right. I've got Robin, yeah, nine fourteen a.m. Yeah, that's the okay. one. Okay, so I think there's a lot of similarities between leading in a crisis and leading when things are going well. The principles, the values, the the broad ways of working still apply in each of those contexts. But the context does matter here, and in fact, in some ways, it's easier to lead in the crisis than it is to lead when things are going well, because in a crisis you are more focused, you are more urgent, you are more driven, uh, but sometimes that can be um, overly compelling. Uh, that's why I said in, the, in my speech that you need to be able to step back from that and see the big picture. But actually, when things are going well is often the time you should be worrying, because what, when things are going well, that's when complacency can seep in. And the thing about complacency is, you don't even know you've got it till it's too late. So in a sense, uh, although there are some things that are more needed in the crisis and some things that are more needed when things are going well, they both have their challenges. Uh, and actually spotting how your context is changing and refreshing your leadership, even if things are going well, is actually a, an important aspect of good leadership. And I know, as I said in my speech, I've done that, I've got that wrong on at least two occasions when Things have been going well in my leadership and I haven't spotted that the context is changing and I haven't realized quickly enough that I needed to change with it. So th there are lots of similarities, but equally leadership in a crisis is, is, is a challenge, but so is leadership in times when it's going well. Yeah. Can I um, go on to the next question? Certainly is that okay? Steve. Yep, sure. go for it. I've got a question from Penny. Um, she actually asked me two really good questions. I want to answer both of them, but the first one is, um, what's the best sorry you've ever saw done or done <laughs> yourself? Um, I think this is a really, really important question because unless you can answer that question, um, it means that you are, um, you're in danger of being one of these people who says, I'm sorry that, uh, I'm sorry that you feel this rather than I take responsibility and I'm sorry I did that. Yeah. And it's such a key distinction. Uh, so, I mean, the two famous uh, sorries are the one that Macron made recently yes. when uh, the president of France, when he said that um, we got this wrong about the lockdown in France, we, we made some mistakes. We've not heard that from the, from the UK government, but we have heard that from the French government and Macron was honest about that. And of course, a very famous one was when Richard Nixon was being interviewed by, interviewed by David Frost many, many years ago and apologize to the American people for things he'd done wrong. But it's rare to see politicians or leaders apologizing for things while they're still in the job. Yeah. And that's such an important thing to do. If you read my book, you'll see that I've made lots of mistakes in my leadership. And I've written about those mistakes. I've written about the fact that I got it wrong, what I learned from that. Unless as leaders we can acknowledge that and say, say if we made a mistake, we did mess up then I think we're, we're worse leaders as a result. I mean, there's lots of examples I can give you that aren't in the book when I mess things up, as well as things that are in the book. Uh, but one thing I, uh, I had to really apologize for was uh, when I was, um, uh, before I became a director of education, I was an assistant director in a local authority. 
And I've never been good with numbers, to be honest. I've never been good with the finances, even though I've managed multi, multi million pound organizations for many years. And in those early days, I got a number wrong. And I told my boss that was a million pound deficit instead of a 10,000 pound deficit. And uh, it took a lot of apologizing uh, <laughs> to, uh, to, on that one because he had a heart attack when I said we were a million pound in debt instead of 10,000 pounds in debt, just by re misreading the number. But anyway, <laughs> there's lots of things I've apologized for. And if you can't apologize, then how can you expect other colleagues to admit mistakes when they mess up and ask for help? Um, the next one I wanted to um, talk about was uh, another one from Robin. What leadership lessons apply both in dip, uh, when you're leading a team, when you're leading a school, when you're leading groups of schools? Are there some common things? This is a really interesting question because it's right at the heart of a current debate on leadership. Because you'll, you'll notice that there's a big debate on Twitter at the moment and, um, on whether leadership development should be domain specific or whether it should be generic. And, and um, people like Tom Reese from Ambition Institute are really arguing quite strongly that we've underemphasized domain specific leadership development. If you want to be able to run a maths department, you need to understand what a great maths department looks like, what great maths teaching looks like, what a great maths curriculum looks like. If you want to run a school, you need to know what great behavior management looks like across a whole school and how to do it. What, great, what a great whole curriculum looks like and how you, how, you, how you develop it. What great school improvement looks like across a school, those kind of things. Uh, and I think he's right about that. I think there has been perhaps an underemphasis on domain specific knowledge in order to do our jobs well in whatever context we find ourselves in. And we've got to be, do what's right for the context in which we do find ourselves in. So I, I applaud that, um, that movement towards more domain specific um, focus. But I also worry about it because actually I think there's also some generic leadership skills that apply across different domains and they are equally important. It's not that the domain specific isn't important, it is very important, but so is the generic. So the generic stuff are things like um, uh, relational trust, living the values, uh, how you model uh, the leadership that you want others to dememonstrate. Uh, generic skills are, are things like how you build trust amongst your team, how you develop a collective vision that people can buy into, uh, so how you chair a meeting, how you communicate to di various different levels within your organization, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. All of these are more generic skills. Now, I would say one thing that is very, very important for me in my leadership over, over a number of years, and it applies whether you're leading a team, a school, a big organization, and of course I've led three very big organizations in my time as a leader, and that's getting a balance right between power and love. And that applies in all of those different leadership roles. And by power, I mean drive, focus, high expectations, determination, energy, commitment, absolute resilience to get uh, to make the change happen and by love i mean kindness empathy inclusivity listening being humble invitational taking people with you and i've wrestled with this all my life as a leader in whatever job i've been in over my whole leadership career getting the balance right between power in my leadership and love in my leadership um, and Sometimes I've pushed too much on the power side because I know I won't get change unless I push, push, push and drive, 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 and I don't lower my expectations. And sometimes in order to counteract that, I've pushed a bit too much on the love side, uh, the listening, the kindness, the understanding, the empathy. And it's a constant balance to get this right. And as leaders, I would say that's the key thing to think about. Whatever your role is, have you got power in your leadership, drive, focus, determination, and have you got love in your leadership? Unless you've got both, you're not going to be a successful leader. And the last thing I'd say about this, Robin, is the job of the leader always is to help those they lead to be as successful as they possibly can be. The job of the leader is to help those they lead to be as successful as they possibly can be in whatever role you happen to be leading. Absolutely. Okay.
Can I, can I pick up one more from Penny, if that's yeah, all right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah, we've got time. Penny's asked a question about, um, uh, let me just find it here, because it was a really good question. Is that the one that we uh, do you think there are things about perception? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. About perception, that perpetuating stereotypes, so the accepted norms of what a leader looks like. Um, that's a great question, Penny, and I just want to spend a bit of time answering it. Yeah. I had a, what I'd call a, an aha moment, uh, a moment when my mind significantly changed on something. And this took place in 2007, or 2008 it was, 2008. So this is 12 years ago. And it was uh, at a meeting of black and Asian school leaders in Bradford. Because at the time I was chief executive of the National College for School Leadership. And uh, we supported a program called the um, Equal Access to Promotion Program. And I was keen on that program. For me at the time, I thought this was about fairness. Everyone should have the fair, fair access. And some black and ethnic minorities were not getting fair access. So for me, my driver at the time was fairness. And at this meeting, I met a woman called um, Rosemary Campbell Stevens, who, was, who actually was a great uh, black leader and, and worked for the National College for some of the time. And she said two things to me which changed my mind completely about this issue. The first thing she said to me was, you are asking us to want to be leaders and to copy leaders that we cannot identify with. The model of leadership you, that, that seems to be talked about here in the UK is not a model of leadership that I or, or some people from my background can identify with. It, it's about being um, sharp elbowed, uh, leading from the front, being the kind of hero leader. And actually, we're not going to get, she said to me, we're not going to get many black and ethnic minority leaders wanting to be leaders unless they like the models and can identify with the models of the leadership that they're seeing. At the moment, they're not seeing enough of the models they can identify with. This was such a key point for me that actually it's not so much fairness, though fairness is really important, absolutely, but it's about developing models of leadership that are attractive to people from different backgrounds that they can identify with, that they want to be a leader in that kind of cultural context. And that was such an issue for me. And it still is an issue for me, actually. And the second thing that Rosemary Campbell Stevens said to me, she said, you're, you're coming at this from a deficit model, from a fairness and deficit model. You should come at this from a positive model. A diverse team is a great thing to have in an organization. It's not just a deficit and address unfairness, it's a positive. So those two moment things that I got from that meeting in 2008 really stayed with me. So it's about developing models of leadership that are attractive to black and ethnic minority uh, and other, other groups. And secondly, it's about celebrating the positivity of diverse leadership rather than thinking it was a deficit model. And the last thing I want to say about this, and there's plenty more, but one of the things I've seen when I've been working in Victoria in Australia um, where they have some of their own race issues because of the indigenous population there. There's some very significant and a, and a pretty awful history of what's happened. They've, they've developed something that they call a talent framework. And what it does is it challenges your institutional and personal bias. It stops you from identifying talent in certain kinds of ways because that's the way in which you or the organization thinks and helps you to think of a much broader definition of talent. And I think there's something positive about having talent frameworks that challenge your personal and institutional bias. And I found that really helpful too. What's next then for questions? Right, we've got probably time for one more question. Where should we jump to next? What about imposter syndrome? Yeah, that, that's... From Stephen. From so what Stephen said is, is a, yeah. a real issue in leadership is imposter syndrome and this can uh, really cripple school leaders. So what advice yeah. would you give to someone okay. feeling like this? Okay, so I think there's two, uh, and again, I've wrestled with this in my own leadership. I think there's two uh, extremes here that we should be really wary of. Sometimes we, are, we become the leader. Uh, and although we think that we're, we've got lots to learn, we, we, we don't really believe in ourselves as a leader at all. We think it's been a mistake and that we shouldn't be there at all. We have no confidence. And we, we, that's a nightmare. It's, it's a nightmare to be led by someone who has zero confidence. 
because actually they're constantly seeking reassurance from people that they're leading and they don't see through difficult things. And uh, so we need some confidence. But I think there's an equal danger that when we, um, when we become a leader and we get some success, we put on the mantle of leadership and we put a crown on as well and we think, we think of ourselves too highly. We start to think that we know it all. We start to think that we can start to drink our own bathwater. Mm. And um, this is a real danger in leadership. It happens an awful lot. And I think that's a real worry. Because if you start to think that you know it all uh, and that you are uh, you're, you're overconfident, then I think that you will, um, you can't, no one can challenge you. The, your, your team will only tell you what, you, what, you, what they think you want to know because you already know the answers. In the end, you'll get complacency. I think it's a great thing to have a fear of failure. I think it's a real positive thing to have a fear of failure and a sense that you don't know it all and the sense that you might mess up. Actually, the worry is if you haven't got that fear of failure, if you think you do know it all and that you can't mess up, that's when we should be worried uh, about if you think you're perfect instead of thinking that you're imperfect. Now, I've wrestled with this all my life as a leader. Sometimes I've found I've lacked confidence a bit too much and not known what to do. And sometimes I've found when I've had some success, I've ended up being a bit too confident. But I'm at my best when I've got a balance right between confidence and humility. And I think that the imposter syndrome is a good thing, provided it's not totally debilitating. That, I think, is the worry. But in terms of doubting yourself, some self-doubt, I think, is a good thing for a leader, which is partly why I wrote the book, Imperfect Leadership. Um, can, I, can I just add something to that? And I think then we'll wrap up. Um, just harking back to what you said about um, leaders very rarely apologise while they're still in their roles and that lack of transparency about when things go right and when they go wrong. Do you think that adds to that culture of when, when you're moving into a leadership role that you think there's a perfection there that actually doesn't exist? So we've actually created the model and sometimes those leadership structures um perpetuate that myth that when you're in leadership you get everything right because you never see anybody putting their hands up and saying we didn't get it right well i think it's up to us to model what good leadership looks like and good leadership looks like admitting mistakes admitting you don't know it all asking for help these are good things these are strengths of leadership mm. unless people see leaders in big organizations or national governments modeling that then we'll perpetuate a bad leadership model which is not authentic and not transparent. So it's up to us as leaders to model what good leadership looks like, which is, colleagues, imperfect. Mm. And we get it wrong sometimes, but it has to be authentic and transparent. Thank you. And I think that, that brings us to the end. I think that's a, that's a, I was going to say an imperfect way to finish the session, um, uh, but I think it's, it's a perfect way to finish the session. Um, in, in some respects, you know, I suppose rejoice in your fallibilities. The transparency, authenticity and honesty, I think, as leaders, and that's come through in all of our sessions. We've had Mary Myatt on, we've had, uh, we had David all the way through to yesterday, where we had um, Sir David Carter. It's, it's, it's all about being authentic. And I think anybody that's seen our sessions leading up until now, the message is very clear. Um, so thank you so much, Steve, for, for your uh, input today, your session today, very thought provoking. And, um, and I know the attendees uh, will have absolutely loved this session. So thank you, Steve. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that brings us to the end of another session of hashtag LD EduChat Leadership Development and Education. And don't forget the conversation is continuing on a Twitter handle, which is at Chilton TSA, at Chilton T uh, TSA, where we've had Flora Burt doing the takeover today. So if you've got any thoughts and you've got any comments or any questions that you want to continue to pose, please do post them. Use the hashtag LD EduChat. Um, Steve Mumby is quite active on Twitter as well, and you'll see him tagged into probably the majority of the posts that uh, we've had on this morning. So do uh, continue that conversation if you weren't able to get the answer that you were looking for today. Click subscribe and click on that little bell, which gives you notifications and when we upload new material, so you haven't got to think about it. We've still got so much coming up, uh, but to round off this week, we've got Oliver Caviglioli tomorrow uh, on Twitter. You'll have seen him as Oli Cav. Um, who will be looking at dual coding for teachers. Um, another fascinating session going into the depths of teaching and learning more specifically to round up this 
really, really fantastic week. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. And if you've got any colleagues that haven't managed to catch this session, send them over to YouTube and make sure you subscribe and so that you don't miss out on anything else. This is me, Arf Kaushal, signing off for another session of hashtag LD EduChat. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.